I handle the food and beverage hospitality sector for our firm, and I'm the fourth generation of my family in the, in the food industry. My father owned a motel and tavern in Brigantine, New Jersey. My grandfather was a restaurateur. My great-grandfather owned a, a grocery in uh, southern New Jersey. Uh, personally, I'm involved in the industry through uh, board and leadership positions in the Mid-Atlantic Food Trade Organization, which represents retailers and uh, food processors, the New Jersey Food Processors, the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association, and the Brewers of Pennsylvania, where I recently recorded a uh, webinar for their 2021 uh, virtual meeting on maximizing the value of your business and preparing your business for sale. If you, you wanna see that, you just have to register for the Brewers of PA uh, virtual conference and it's on demand throughout the month of February. So I'm excited about this, this panel as we explore how uh, PE investment has really uh, helped, as we like to say, whipped up uh, interest and growth in, in, in the food industry. Um, once viewed as, a, as kind of a strictly but unspectacular investment, food is really attracting interest from, from a variety of private investors. Uh, it's seen in some quarters as having the same or greater investment potential as durable goods or even tech. And it's attracting private investment as a result. Uh, BC and PE in investments are increasing in importance as a funding vehicle for the food industry for both new and established companies. And when done judiciously, it has the potential to give food companies both the money and the flexibility they need to succeed. Uh, PE firms acquired over 350 food companies in the US and Canada during 2018 and 2019. 2020 obviously was a bit different and we'll talk about that uh, during our program. So let me introduce each of our, our panelists and give them a, a couple of minutes to uh, tell you uh, about themselves. So why don't we start with uh, Clayton Parrott uh, investment professional with Miller Investment Management. Sure. Um, so I'm on the private equity group here at uh, Miller Investment Management. Uh, Miller was founded in 1998 as a traditional RIA um, and by our founding partner, uh, Scott Miller. Uh, since that time, we've, we've grown into uh, both the private equity and, and real estate business. On the real estate side, we're investing in commercial real estate properties in the greater Philadelphia area. And then on the, the private equity side, where I spend most of my time, uh, we invest in principally in growth capital, growth equity, uh, with a, with a focus on food. Some of our larger investments um, are in the, the franchisor Five Guys, and then in uh, locally in Honey Grow, um, and you know a host of other companies. I sit on the board of five of our companies, including Honey Grow, uh, and I'm an advisor to the Five Guys guys, <laughs> Five Guys group, um, and we uh, try to invest in. Um, Kind of high growth companies, industry agnostic, but with a you know on a dollar weighted basis, have a focus on on food. Thanks very much. Yep. Now I'd like to introduce Neil Salmon, the Chief Financial Officer of Iron Hill Brewery and Restaurant. Welcome, Neil. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, so um, you know I work with Iron Hill Brewery, which is a uh, it's an upscale, casual, for full service, dine in restaurant group. Um, we are all about fresh from scratch food and uh, craft beer. Um, every one of our locations has a, a brewery inside the restaurant uh, where we make small batch beers um, and, you know, serve it right there on site. So um, we have been in business. We're actually celebrating our 25th year uh, this year. Uh, we started really at kind of the, the start of the craft beer uh, boom and, um, you know, really kind of filled that niche um, at the time. We, uh, we're a founder-based company um, and had our first private equity investment uh, at the start of 2016. I was brought on board uh, in 2014 to help professionalize the business and help get it ready for that investment. Um, we have now grown to 19 locations. We actually just opened our 18th and 19th in December uh, of 2020. So we actually opened three, three new locations during the pandemic as we had already started the construction on those pre-pandemic. Um, and we're able to get those open and finish the projects. And also just uh, included in that was our first kind of full scale production brewery, uh, which is also our new headquarters. So we, we still have a couple of sites that we have leases on that we're going to be opening in the coming months. But, um, 
you know, aside from that, just kind of putting the growth on hold and just making sure we, we get through this, uh, this time. And now I'd like to introduce Andy Schwartz, the CEO and co-founder of Extra Chef. Welcome, Andy. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Extra Chef is a, it's a financial management tool specifically for restaurants. Um, when we started to dig into the hospitality space about six, seven years ago, uh, we found out that there was a lot of correlation between the accounting processes and, and food cost management. And in a lot of areas, you know, that's separated with different systems, different silos, different workflows. Um, so we, we leverage machine learning and AI to capture vendor invoices, identify what the data is, and then kick it downstream into intelligent solutions to let you know that food costs are going up that day. So it's a, it's a real-time understanding of your P&L in a restaurant, which is changing every day. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, to remind everyone what uh, Mona said, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat and we'll jump to your questions periodically during, during our program. So my first question is that there are many private equity and venture capital firms investing in food, beverage, and hospitality sector. So what advice would you give a business owner to find a good fit beyond looking for an investor with industry expertise, which I think seems uh, obvious, or maybe it's not. So let's start with, with, with Neil on that one. Yeah, I mean, I would say- connect, Yeah, how did you connect with your, your PE firm? Well, I think, you know, so looking at that through the lens of a portfolio company, it was, it was super critical for us to find someone that would really share our core values and buy into our mission statement. And I, and I you know, again, that may seem obvious, but kind of when you look at that from our standpoint, as I mentioned, we're a fresh from scratch concept, which, you know, given that scenario, we have a lot of, a lot of additional labor for prep labor. So it's not necessarily the most cost effective, but it's, it's core to our brand. And we also have, as I mentioned, the breweries in every location. So, you know, we're eating up um, rental space with that. There's square footage. Our box has to be bigger to fit that in. We have the additional labor of the head brewers and, and you know, assistant brewers. So it's not necessarily, you know, it's, it's kind of that, that situation is, is extremely important to us and to our core value, but maybe not necessarily, you know, there's some additional costs that go along with those things. And so, you know, we didn't want someone to come in and just kind of change what we were all about. It was, it was extremely important for us to have a partner who would, who would see those things, you know, realize that those are a part of our secret sauce and that they would be willing to keep those as part of our brand going forward. So, you know, I think, you know, through the process, just talking to different groups and seeing the different mentality, just making sure that someone that was aligned, you know, with those philosophies and those thought processes was extremely important to us. And, you know, we were lucky to find a great partner who has enabled us to do that. Andy, how about your uh, investor? Did you find them or did they find you? Yeah, so really good question. I think, you know, we run this, we ran this process just like we would run any other process. So for me, a process starts with a lot of research, right? So what, what I've found to be successful is for the type of company we are, we really want to be in the sweet spot of that investment group, right? And by sweet spot, I mean three things for us. One, we're a subscription-based technology company. So we want somebody that's very focused on SaaS tech. Then we're a little interesting because we're SaaS tech, but we're hospitality. So you really need to make sure that when you're talking to an investor, they haven't been burnt in the past by a hospitality investment. So you want to do your research. You want to see, you know, who exited Grubhub, who exited Postmates, you know, who has just made a lot of money on a technology hospitality investment. Those people might be more inclined to make another hospitality technology investment. Because Fred, as you mentioned, hospitality has always been a little bit of a riskier investment than certain other groups because it's fragmented and uh, restaurants are seen as really more like month to month cash flow type so tight solutions. So you need to get somebody that is comfortable with hospitality because you're not going to turn them if they're not right. So for us, it's uh, SaaS, it's hospitality, and then it's stage. Stage is really important. If for us, it's all about recurring revenue. That's all people care about is recurring revenue. So people like to invest sub 5 million, 5 million to 10 million, 
10 million to 50 million. So you've got to find an investor that fits because if you're not in their sweet spot, it's going to, you're going to get a no down the road at some point when it gets to some type of investment committee. So it's those three things that, that we really look for. And Clayton, how about from, from your, your perspective uh, in, in connecting with your portfolio companies, especially those in the hospitality sector? Yeah, no, and Andy's exactly right. I think, you know, you need a good fit. You need to be in their sweet spot of their investment mandate. And, um, you know, if you're looking at a fund, not only is the is the industry important, is their investment mandate important, because as Andy says, it's not going to get past an IC. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fund term, making sure that your, your growth uh, is not, you know, the fund life doesn't end in a year or so, um, making sure the people are there uh, for, for the long haul. And they're not going to, you know, if, if, if your deal team lead leaves, that you're not going to be orphaned and just, uh, you know, floating around a, a large fund with, you know, no one to love you. Um, I would say all important factors in, in choosing a right PE firm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think it would be naive to hold a meeting like this without addressing the, the COVID effect on 2020 business performance. How, how did pandemic driven operating restrictions and changes to customer behavior uh, affect your, your companies? Why don't we start with Andy on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think our story is probably no different than a lot of people on this call. I mean, 2020 was by far the craziest year of my life. I mean, going from working in an office to working at home with three kids under five, no, no help, no school. And then you've got 40 employees in a business in the restaurant industry, which is probably the hardest hit, you know, that and nightlife and, and concerts. So it, it, it was a tough 2020. And I think that we, we braced for a really, really challenging year. And by that, I mean, we had to make the tough decision to cut 25% of our workforce in uh, April. I, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I held back doing it. But then ultimately, I just knew that I didn't know what the next six, nine months were going to hold. And I felt like it was irresponsible to continue to pay salespeople and all of this. Now, while I say that, we had about two, three months of downtime where restaurant people didn't know about dining out or delivery or takeout. People were concerned that were you going to get COVID from a takeout box? And I think once that's, you know, once that was dismissed, that it, that was safe, it gave restaurants enough time to pivot to pick up and take out and delivery and 25% capacity and outdoor. So we actually ended up having a really good year despite a challenging time for restaurants. We, we focused a little bit more on quick service and takeout and, you know, your taco places, your burger places, the places that focused on one menu item that could take out really well. Um, those places did well. We put a little bit less emphasis on fine dining, which struggled, but we did see some fine dining groups that had enough money to weather the storm that really wanted to take this time to take a look at tech and operations and what you know, restaurant 2.0 is going to look like leveraging technology. So it ended up being a pretty good year for us. Uh, we got some money from the government, which was a huge help. It really got us through the year uh, that PPP loan, and uh, and now we're focused on 21 and and have a, a positive outlook on on what we hope to see as a, a good year. Neil, I'm guessing your story is a little different. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I mean, a lot of what 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 Andy said there, I mean, exactly applies. And I think it's, I actually heard a quote recently that said, we're all in the same storm, but not all necessarily in the same boat. And I think, you know, some, some industries, some businesses, even some restaurants have done extremely well over the last year, depending on, you know, what their product is or, or their particular situation. Obviously us in the restaurant industry with all the mandates and restrictions, it has been, you know, just an extremely challenging year. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're still, we're still in the middle of it. We're not out of it yet. Um, and I think, you know, we're just kind of looking at to try and determine what this recovery is going to look like. Um, you know, and I think we have some, some situations, you know, as an example, um, in 2018, we launched our first restaurant in Center City, Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, at the start of the pandemic, that was actually our top performing restaurant. Uh, however, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, it became our worst performing restaurant. And not only you know, did, was it challenged by the pandemic, but 
you know, there were also protests and things like that going on uh, in Center City, Philadelphia, and we're right on Market Street. So that location had to be boarded up, completely shut down, no takeout, no delivery. You know, you still have the rents, you still have those types of things. Uh, you know, and that, that location specifically is, is highly dependent on convention center activity. It's highly dependent on hotel and travel industry, which, you know, there's no guarantee that's coming back. Certainly not 2021, hopefully, you know, 2022. Uh, it's also highly dependent on, you know, a daytime workforce, which, you know, as we all know, everyone is kind of working remote. You don't have that same traffic, that same sort of day pop uh, that we used to have. So, you know, restaurants in the city are really going to feel some different effects than, you know, some restaurants in other places. Um, you know, but, but listen, I think, you know, we believe that those, you know, restaurant groups that survived the pandemic, there's going to be opportunities on the other side. And, you know, we're just kind of fighting every day to get to that point. We, um, you know, we're, we're certainly hopeful for a successful vaccine rollout. And hopefully, uh, you know, we had, we were blessed with some great weather in the fall, you know, obviously with outdoor dining being in this locate, you know, being in this area, we do have some locations down South that aren't quite as affected by weather, which is good, <laughs> but the, you know, the locations that are in this, this region are highly dependent on the weather, particularly in the spring for the outdoor dining. So, you know, hopefully we get some, some, some luck there as we head into the spring and uh, we can get some outdoor dining back uh, because that would be huge. But, you know, really the, the biggest thing, and, and Andy kind of alluded to this is as we headed into the pandemic was just, you know, I, I remember back from like, I think my first day at college, they said cash is king. And I mean, that really is just, you know, all of a sudden it, it just all comes you know, down to liquidity and trying to manage through that process. You know, we stayed open throughout the entire pandemic with the exception of Center City, uh, which we had to close for the reasons I you know, just mentioned. But, you know, we were able to, to maintain a lot of our workforce. You know, that was really important to us. But, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of taken day by day and, and making sure that we, we pivot and do the things we need to do. You know, we were a brand that really wasn't in the delivery game. Um, prior to the pandemic, but obviously we've had to do that. And again, as, as Andy kind of mentioned, you know, when the pandemic first hit, we completely pivoted and we were actually selling like toilet paper. We were selling, you know, eggs, milk, because our supply chain was a little different. And, you know, as everyone remembers, the grocery stores are having a real hard time stocking that stuff, but we were able to get, get our hands on some of those items. So we would sell, you know, we would sell our typical, you know, food and, and, and those types of things. But also, you know, we were selling a roll of toilet paper, we were selling an apple, we were selling a gallon of milk, just trying to help the communities we were serving. So, you know, we've come a long way since that time, but, uh, you know, we are hopeful for the future. But, um, you know, it is it is still a fight, kind of a grind day by day here. Now, Clayton, I know some of your portfolio companies uh, were already uh, strong in, in the takeout uh, mar marketplace as opposed to a, a sit down. How, how did your portfolio uh do during the uh, 2020? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll constrain it to um, to our restaurant portfolio companies, but you know, as, as Neil and, and Andy alluded to, uh, everyone was, uh, it was a tumultuous environment for everyone, you know, from, from our perspective back in, in March and April, when things really started to, to come to, to a head that it was gonna be a very <laughs> significant uh, event. We, you know, made sure all our, all our, um, Portfolio companies pulled credit lines. We, we contemporaneously ran of quite a few processes to uh, try and get additional capital into our portfolio companies, whether that's uh, you know additional subordinated debt or you know additional equity investments from from us. Um, so we we really looked at at all options, and, and in March and April, um, you know sales really took took a hit regardless of, you know, size or, or ge geography or, <laughs> or whatever. So um, it was a, it was a scary time. And, uh, you know, all the management teams, uh, you know, credit to them really huddled up and, you know, both in Honey Grow and Five Guys, they had curbside delivery where they didn't have curbside delivery before they had that up and running in two weeks. Um, delivery, thank goodness, was already fully, um, fully fleshed out in both those concepts. So they were able to kind of pivot to, to delivery, which was, which was an important aspect. Um, you know, everything from the supply chains was, it was stressed. I mean, we have, you know, five guys, we have uh, quite a few different um, uh, suppliers, but just making sure on, you know, there's four main suppliers and making sure uh, each of those suppliers are, are kind of backfilled with additional capacity, depending on geography. Uh, just because the, the lack of supply was was a whole project in and of itself, um, so there's quite a bit of work um, going on. And as 
the, the kind of pandemic progressed and, and sales started to, to kind of come back, um, you know, just dealing with a, a very different consumer behavior. So uh, heavier on delivery, but also day parts and seasonality have, have totally shifted where, uh, you know, you used to have your, your training or, or your quote unquote B team in on the weekend. Now weekends are, are even you know, busier than the weekdays. Um, so it's just adjust, adjusting staffing. Um, you know, typically there's some seasonality in restaurants where you have a, a, a sales come off in August as people come back to school. That didn't happen. Uh, it just kind of stayed strong. Um, so just dealing with the seasonality shifts uh, and, and, you know, uh, making sure you know, everything stays tight was, is, as the pandemic has progressed, has been uh, just a very busy time for all our portfolio companies. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I that I hear often when I when I talk to um, entrepreneurs who are looking for outside investment is they say that you can either sell on the promise or you can sell on the data, but not really both at, at the same time. And so my question is, when when you are pitching to uh, Neil and to Andy, or when you're listening to, to Clayton, how do you determine which perspective will be most successful? And, and I know that and because your uh, businesses are all kind of in different stages, maybe you have different answers to this. So I guess I'll reach out to a a Andy uh, first. As you're looking for uh, capital, is it the data or, or is it the promise that you rely on? Yeah, I mean, you have to be able to have a product that adds value to your customer. In, in our case, our customers are restaurants. So our focus and our mission is to provide software technology to add profitability to restaurants. So if you could think about that every day, does my product help a restaurant understand their margins? Does it help them you know, uh, decrease their food cost? Does it help them understand their cash flow better? And if you could really focus on providing an easy to use, flexible solution that is affordable, which you could do these days with software. You know, our software is $149 a month and it gives you everything, inventory, recipe management, AP automation, uh, P&L you know, generation. That stuff used to be thousands of dollars. Now, because of the cloud and because of the way things are, it's, it's hundreds of dollars. So if you could do that, and you could do that at scale. You can then get to a larger opportunity in our world, which is taking a look at food cost and vendor pricing and ingredient pricing and looking at data over time to provide restaurants like Iron Hill with a better understanding of how they're spending their money. So I think you've got to do the first one, which is add value, build a scalable company with product that works and easy to use and good customer service. And if you sell, if you, if that's your mission and vision and you have a plan of how to scale that, hopefully you could get money. And then maybe there's a bigger vision down the road that leverages the community or data to have a bigger effect on the industry. That, that's how I think about it. Neil, your company, obviously a lot more mature, uh, like you said, 25th anniversary. So you had certainly had a lot of data behind you, but also I know big plans to expand geographically beyond the, the metropolitan uh, Philadelphia area. So what do you think sold your investor, your, your promise or, or, or your data? You know, I, I think it, I think it's honestly, it, it's a little bit of both of those, right? Because, you know, in our, at the time, 20 year history, um, you know, we had average unit volumes that were, that had grown year over year uh, with the exception of like, you know, when there was the recession in 2008 or, you know, some of those kinds of things. So, so, I mean, we really had a solid track record, which everyone knows in the restaurant industry, you know, is, is very difficult. But the real question I think was, is, you know, is our brand exportable and can we open up outside of the, you know, the Philadelphia sort of Delaware tri-state area where we have a lot of brand recognition, where people really, you know, know who we are and they, they kind of uh, already are buying into what we're, we're pr producing, um, you know, before they even come through the door. So, so that really was kind of the part of the promise was to see, you know, can we open up outside of this region, you know, where, where maybe we don't have as much brand recognition and still be successful. And so that's why we've, you know, we've expanded down, um, you know, we, we have a couple of sites in, 
in Atlanta, South Carolina, looking at North Carolina, I think kind of filling the gap. And, you know, those sites have done extremely well. And I think, <clears throat> honestly, you know, again, because, because, you know, I think the quality of our food, you know, the, the, the quality of our beer really, it's a testament to our culinary department and our brewery department um, that, you know, people, I think people always want to have a good dine out experience, right? That's, that's, that's just sort of a natural um, and desirable uh, uh, experience to, that, that people want. So, you know, once people can kind of pick up on that and they, they, they understand what we're, you know, what we're providing, then, you know, we, we've been able to, uh, you know, successfully export to the, some of these locations and, and, you know, look forward to continuing to do so in the future. Great, great. And Clayton, how about you? I'm sure you're pitched all the time on great promise with, without much data behind it. Does, any, does that ever move you? No, I mean, yeah, I would, I would echo some of Neil com Neil's comments. Um, you need a little bit of both. I mean, we, we look at decks every week and they all kind of have the same growth curve. So <laughs> we, we definitely need, uh, you know, perhaps it's just a reflection of, of the stage at which we're investing, but we need, you know, ample data to support, you know, a, a, a rollout that, or a growth curve that is projected in, in any number of, of decks that were sent. Um, you know, in, in the restaurant space, the, the unit economics have to be there and they have to be, as, as Neil was alluding to, uh, shown in different, dem different demographic, um, you know, fits and different um, rental markets and, and, and be able to be exported because, you know, you know the, the growth curve involves stamping out a bunch of units. So making sure that they, uh, you know, the company can, can actually act on that and, um, you know, has, has the management team with the experience to, to do that. Um, the development team, making sure you have a, a white box that is, um, you know, a, a, a pretty good build out. Um, and, and then on some of the other uh, non-restaurant companies, it's kind of the same thing. You need data to um, kind of support the growth, uh, whether it's, you know, in, in Andy's case, uh, you know, his uh, SaaS based model having a, a value add to, to lead to a scalable growth. Um, you need, I think, the data to support um, a growth plan because everyone shows you a growth plan. <laughs> cool. uh, a company called Big Idea Ventures uh, has created a, a, what they're calling a generation food fund. They've raised $250 million to target technologies and companies that will transform the global food system by reducing plastics, water, waste, and carbon emissions throughout the supply chain. So my question is, is sustainability a sector worth prioritizing within the ROI timeframes that your businesses uh, require? Neil, how's Iron Hill addressing this? <clears throat> you know, I mean, I would say, so, so as we have grown um, and, and, you know, we build new sites, new locations, making sure that we have, you know, the high efficiency, uh, mechanicals, making sure we have the high efficiency lighting, making sure that we have all those things in place is extremely important. And then as we adopt those things, we can, you know, we, we you froze on us. I'm not sure if you can hear me. <clears throat> why, don't, why don't we jump to, uh, to Andy on, on this one? Uh, is sustainability sure. a, a important in your company? I mean, I think it starts with, you know, our belief that that sustainability is important to the world, right? So, um, you know, I don't think it's a secret that companies should have an obligation to do what what's right, not just for their shareholders, but what's right for the world. So we feel that way. Uh, we're a small footprint company, right? We've got 50 employees. We all work from home. Uh, so we, we feel good about that. Now, what we're what we're solving for in terms of our technology around the supply chain is something that we think a lot about, right? So when we think about the supply chain for a restaurant, uh, in all cases, you've got your farmers and manufacturers, and then you've got in the middle, these big distributors and vendors, and, and those people sell all the food to the restaurant. So you've got that supply chain and we kind of fit in between the vendors and the restaurants. And we've got a platform that connects the two and they can communicate and restaurants can pay vendors digitally. So you're getting rid of mailing checks. Um, you're, you have a piece of technology that can, that can intake the food when you receive it 
and calculate any type of short pay and stuff. So I think when you look at the supply chain of a restaurant, you know, that's going to change a lot in the future. And, and I think that's important, but we're, we're not in the area of, you know, an iron Hill where we need to look at, you know, what our plants are doing and stuff like that. Leighton, what about your uh, portfolio companies? Um, I know Hunt, Hunt and Grow uh, has its sort of a environmental mission uh, kind of front and center. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I would, I would echo Andy's comments in that sustainability is, is important regardless. But and, and I would also catch our statements is we have kind of a longer time horizon on which we invest on. So I would say generally it is uh, worth, the, worth the effort to, to try and uh, focus on sustainability. Um, you know, but I would say a lot of the sustainability projects that we've seen have been immediately accretive. Uh, you know, it's not a, it's not like you're investing for a 10 year change. It's, you know, immediately reducing waste in your restaurant, um, which is, has an immediate benefit. So I'd, I'd say it's abs absolutely worth, uh, worth prioritizing. Uh, to follow up on that, um, you mentioned your investment horizons are, are, are long term. Is any of that uh, in industry? related that like your uh, ROI expectations on the food industry uh, different than the other industries that you're you're investing in because obviously you have to kind of balance between making changes to drive short-term ROI and invest you know in, in a future that may be even longer term than your particular investment time horizon. Sure. Um... I mean, for, for Miller, our, our time horizon is longer than probably our competitors within the restaurant space. Um, but in, and I guess if you take a step back, the restaurant space in general has a different return profile than perhaps a, you know, a SaaS based uh, investment model as you know, there's an expectation of, of interim cash flows unless you're really high growth and, and then you wanna you know, have ample investment opportunities in which case, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a all being all the cash flows are being redeployed into capex, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it it is a tightrope to walk in, in terms of managing ROI. But um, you know, I think it, it's a generally the same as any other industry. It's just a different um, different equation to get to that ROI. Um, how about uh, Neil? I want to ask you also about the, the, the time horizon. You got your investment. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, are you looking at this as a uh, you know, a ten year partnership to continue to fuel your growth? Uh, you know, I, I think initially, I think the thought process was that um, you know the horizon would be more of a you know in, in the five to ten uh, you know range. Obviously, with 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 everything that's gone on the last year, you know we've had to kind of pivot and make sure that. Uh, um, you know, we get, we take the necessary steps here to, to get to the next, next phase. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that we're kind of in that horizon timeline where, you know, I would expect that, uh, you know, there might be another transaction in our, in our near future here. And I apologize. I, I dropped on that sustainability. I'm competing with four virtual uh, learning students here. So uh, the bandwidth is, you know, at high, high premium here. Okay. Is there anything you want to add now that you're connected again? I'm not even sure where I got cut off. I will say, you know, just kind of anecdotally, one thing that we do is our, all of our spent grains uh, in our in our breweries go to local farmers that feed their cows and pigs and and things like that. But I mean, it's it's you know, it's it's extremely important. You know, we we do it with our new locations to make sure that we're putting in high efficiency, um, you know, mechanicals and equipments, and then can retrofit the existing ones to be able to do that as well. Good. Now, Andy, you've got more of a venture capital than than a PE. Uh, type of investment. So obviously a, a shorter time horizon, uh, I imagine, in your relationship. Well, I actually think it's, I actually think they look, they look at it a little bit differently, Fred. Like when I think of, of the capital markets, you've got, you know, private equity and then growth equity and then venture. And I think, you know, for us, our, our backers or our, our partners are, are venture. And I think that from what I understand, Clayton, you might know better than me, like their, their fund duration is, is longer because they're, they're making an early bet, maybe in some cases pre-revenue or, or you know, one million of recurring revenue. So they're going to invest, they're looking for larger multiples, you know, so they're looking for, they're making bigger bets with bigger risks. So, you know, they might be looking to return their whole fund with one investment. So they're willing to take 
you know, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but they're willing to take 99 losses and one win. But as long as that one win is going to, if they have a $250 million fund, as long as that one win is going to return that fund, then that's kind of the game they're playing. So we always saw this as like a seven to 10 year uh, kind of plan. We're in the fifth year, but I think plans change, right? So in the beginning, it was about getting to a thousand customers. Now we're at 5,000 customers. And now we're thinking about plans to get to 15,000 customers. So I think uh, you want a partner that can be with you along the way. I've found that the venture community uh, is willing to sit with you for 10, 15, 20 years. As long as you're growing, uh, you are seeing in SaaS, it's not all overnight successes. You are seeing some maturity, you know, as you get into year 10 and year 15. And, you know, you've got, you know, $50 billion market caps on companies, 90 billion on Square and companies like that. So you're starting to see that. And, and I think the venture community it is in, in it for more of the long haul. You'd agree with that, right, Clayton? Yeah, I think, I mean, venture implicitly has a little bit more flexibility and, and I think, you know, expectation that not all the deals are going to work out and they're, you know, they can distribute uh, to their LPs, those, those companies and just take the loss or, or hold them indefinitely. Um, but yeah, there, there's a longer time horizon and you, you do have a lower hit rate, but a higher you know, return on those investments. And I don't know if it's one out of a hundred, but it's certainly uh, lower hit rate on the successes, but and just write off the the non successes is, is the kind of the mo of, of venture capital for sure. Great, thanks. Uh, one of the companies we see in the news uh, that I know pretty well is called Blue Nalu. It's a cell based seafood company, and they announced uh, sixty million dollars of financing, and uh, announced the goal to sell cell based seafood to customers by the end of 2021. Uh, another company called Future Meat Technologies received 27 million in new funding to get affordable cell-based chicken on the market by 2022. It's available, but it's very expensive and they've developed a technology to, to bring the price down. So my question is with, with cell-based food poised to be one of the next marketable innovations, what are you seeing from your perspectives as new investment opportunities, uh, maybe new category creators that are not yet receiving uh, much, much notice. Give us a kind of glimpse uh, in, into the future. So Clayton, what, what, are you, what are you seeing from your perch? Sure, um, you know, I don't know if there's one specific, you know, cell-based food, certainly an area that's gotten a lot of investment dollars recently. I don't know if there's one specific sub-industry I'd point to as kind of the next uh, big thing, but, you know, I think innovation as an asset class, uh, I think you've seen this in public markets with the ARC funds and Kathy Woods group, but uh, innovation as, a, as an asset class continues to be an, an extremely compelling uh, place to put dollars. You have very high growth um, within innovation, disrupting kind of legacy businesses, which continues to be, um, you know, an, an interesting investment thesis only brought forward by, by coronavirus and COVID, um, where you have the uh, rapid adoption of some of these nascent industries, um, just leading to, to kind of a bring forward of, of adoption of innovation. So I think that asset class or, you know, innovation as an asset class will continue to be an interesting place to invest. Do you have a perspective on this? I do. You know, I think that, uh, I think fundamentally, if you believe that we as, a, as people need to get off of some of these types of foods that create a lot of waste, that hurt the environment, that aren't physically great for you as, as people, for, for your health. So I think if you believe in that, then you believe that these markets are going to take off because there's enough people specifically of certain generations as, as you get into younger people that feel really strongly about this. So if there are that many people that don't want to drink whole milk, right, and want to drink pea milk or soy milk or different type of milk, then you just know that that's going to take off because one, it's not that healthy for you. Two, you know, it's very, it's not great for the environment. And three, you know, ultimately, I think that it's there's going to be money in it. So I think if you look at all of those things, I think it's something if you feel strongly about, then then you've got to try to find ways to, to build it into the future of, of investing. Very cool. Uh, one, one of the questions in our, in our chat 
uh, asked about uh, vertical integration. So obviously, uh, Iron Hill does both brewing and uh, you know, uh, providing food as, 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 a, as a restaurant. Uh, do you see this kind of vertical integration, you know, uh, purchasing uh, suppliers uh, as, as part of the future? And I'll, I'll start with, with, with Clayton and ask about your companies, sure. because uh, certainly managing that supply chain is, is, is a key to, to their success. Do you see vertical integration uh, going anywhere? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's more of a lever for mature businesses. Um, you know, typically you're more constrained by capital availability than you are by, in, you know, places to put it uh, if you're, you know, a growing business. So your your highest use of capital should be your, your you know, investing in growth within your own business. Um, to the extent that that's not an option or there's a lack of investment opportunities, then you can explore vertical integration and, and try and capture some, some return on you know, buying a, a supplier or the like. But I would focus first on, on your core business and do that really well and exhaust the investment uh, opportunity within your own space before venturing out to, to vertical integration and really say it's more of a play for a more mature player. I'll kind of twist this a little bit for, for Neil in that... Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, delivery options have really uh, become very important uh, in all aspects of the, of, of the food business, whether you're in uh, processing, distribution, cert certainly in the hospitality uh, sector. That you know, could be a, a, an integration uh, opportunity where you start to own some of your own de delivery options instead of hiring out uh, third parties. Uh, how are things looking at, uh, at at Iron Hill Brewery? There's a, there's certainly a move with you know ghost kitchens that do delivery only, uh, and kind of uh, changing your, your business model uh, a little bit. Yeah, I mean that that that's a great question because we you know through the pandemic we've actually um, changed changed a lot of of kind of our business model and also just sort of what we're thinking about for the future. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we weren't really in the delivery game pre-pandemic. And, you know, there's a lot of restaurant companies, I think, that were in the same boat as us that, that just weren't, you know, because our, our, our product is about experience. It's about the craft beer on site, the service. It's all kind of pieces to it. Um, but we had actually made an investment in 2019 with an online ordering product that enabled us to just basically flip the switch and partner with a lot of these, uh, you know, big delivery, kind of the, 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 the biggest brands out there. Um, so we were able to make that transition relatively easily. But we also, you know, through the pandemic, we, we had actually, we had been in the process of building our first production brewery, which, which I mentioned, with the, the thesis behind that was that, you know, right now our top selling beer is our light lager, um, just because of the nature of demand. But, you know, craft, you know, the small batch breweries in the restaurants, they don't necessarily want to brew light lager, uh, and we don't necessarily want them brewing light lager. So, so the idea behind the production brewery was that, we could gain economies of scale on brewing things like our signature beers, as an example, our light lager, some of our seasonal beers. Um, but with the pandemic, you know, we, we immediately jumped into the retail business uh, right away, uh, which has, you know, helped us to get beer on the shelves. It's been, a, it's been a, you know, sort of diversified our revenue streams. We also have launched, uh, you know, our own kind of version of a ghost kitchen uh, called Maltese um, Tenders and Wings, because, uh, you know, and, and the idea with that is, that, um, you know, as I think probably most people know, chicken tenders, chicken wings have absolutely uh, blown up uh, through the pandemic, you know, as has uh, pizza. Um, so, you know, we, we, we wanted to sort of expand our, our customer base to, to reach out to people and, and have a brand that's out there that sort of specifically focuses on, um, uh, you know, on, on those tenders and wings that someone that wants to get that, they can kind of see that real easily. And it's still, you know, the Iron Hill branding is all part of it, but it's given us sort of a lever, another lever to pull. And then, you know, kind of lastly, we also, you know, we were always sort of that big box full service restaurant, but now with the production brewery, and I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we anticipate there's going to be opportunities on the other side of the pandemic that there, you know, there will likely be a lot of spaces available and potentially smaller spaces uh, where we could put in a tap house and then help supply that tap house with the beer you know, our own beer that we're producing in this production brewery. So we're just, we're kind of keeping that open as an option to look at, you know, you know, putting forward tap houses in the future, having this production brewery doing retail beer, um, you know, also doing this, 
you know, kind of ghost kitchen concept with our, with our tenders and wings, uh, but then also sticking to our core restaurant and making sure that we focus on that. And as, you know, as the uh, recovery happens to make sure that we're still delivering on all of our, all of our promises there. Uh, since all three of you have, have been through some uh, very interesting uh, transactions, I was curious whether during the due diligence uh, process, whether there were sort of any unexpected bumps that, that you encountered and, and, and how you uh, resolved them. I'm not asking you to uh, disclose any, anything that would breach confidentiality, but for uh, all of us who are, who are listening in, you know, due diligence is an integral part of, part of the deal. And uh, sometimes it can, it can make or break it. So I'm just curious whether, whether there's any uh, particular guidance that, that you can share uh, regarding due diligence and, and maybe a particular uh, situation to, to uh, drive that, that point home. So I'll, I'll start with Clayton on, on with that question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would say in every deal, uh, there's a hiccup in due diligence that requires some adjustment. Um, usually it's through a, a change in price or a, a change in the legal docs. Um, you know, examples would be, uh, you know, uh, esoteric change of control provisions in someone's employment contract, um, you know, getting lease assignments on, on if, you're, if you're changing the uh, legal structure, getting those leases assigned is always a, is sometimes impossible uh, with, with certain landlords. Um, you know, and, and the, the resolution is just, a, 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 you know, I'm sure there's usually a, a legal remedy you can do um, or a, a price adjustment to, to account for whatever unknown you've, you've uncovered. Neil, how about you in your uh, transaction? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to, to echo Clayton, I mean, there, there's, you know, when you, when you kind of dive down into the details of all these different, you know, um, documents that you have and contracts and agreements and leases and, and everything else, I mean, there, there's, there's clearly a lot of opportunities. I mean, how many times have you signed a contract, sent it off, and then, you know, you don't have the, the second signature on the contract coming mm -hmm. back or whatever the case is. And, um, you know, as you go through that process, I mean, there, there are just so many things that you, that you find and just having that extremely well organized, um, and, you know, again, kind of like Clayton said, I mean, you, you got to work through it pretty quick, but, you know, we, we, you know, came across one thing with the formation of a company from like years ago that was never an issue, but kind of became, you know, a situation at the 11th hour that we had to work through and you have the attorneys involved and, you know, all other parties and just trying to get those things rectified as quickly as possible. But it really is just a, an exercise of, you know, dotting I's and crossing T's, so to speak, to uh, make sure that you have all that documentation, not only completed, but also organized that you can kind of easily access it and, um, you know, that, that makes sense and that someone else can follow. Andy, I know that you, your investor has uh, done a number of deals in the <clears throat> sort of food and hospitality sector in, in, in our region. A any lessons learned from your due diligence experience? <clears throat> I think just, just two things, two rules of thumb, like you should be as transparent as possible up front. And if you're able to articulate, you know, the, the ups and downs of your business, then when it gets into diligence, there are no surprises. And I would say as a business, I learned this from a, a friend of mine who's a director of finance, you should keep your business due diligence ready at all times. So, you know, literally, like if I were to call our director of finance and say, hey, we're going to raise around tomorrow. The business should be prepared to do that. That means financials should be in order. Taxes for last year should be done. KPI should be updated as quick as you can for month's end. So if you set that precedent of trying to keep the business due diligence ready at all times, which we are, because we're raising around every year, you know, we're doing different things. So I think if you could do those two things, tr transparency about what's really going on in your business and then having tight financials, it, it should... Uh, for us, it's different. We don't have leases there. It, you know, our documents are a little bit more standard in terms of like, here's what a term sheet looks like. And here are the 12 things you need for diligence. And here's your data room. Uh, it's a little bit more standard for us, but that, those are the kind of the things I've learned. Cool. Now, um, we all read in the news about how organic <clears throat> food product sales continue to grow year over year. Uh, I read a statistic that organic produce sales were up over 14% in 2020 compared to uh, about 11% increase for conventional produce sales. 
So how does the growing interest in organic and sort of the better for you movement uh, affect your future plans? So let's start with, 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 with Neil and then go to Clayton on that one. Yeah, you, you know, I think, I really believe that Iron Hill has really kind of been at the forefront of this, particularly the better for you uh, movement for years. I mean, we, we've had on our menu like a healthy section and, um, you know, it, it really kind of comes down to just menu in, uh, innovation, you know, making sure that you're staying relevant with, with you know, the desires of the, uh, of the guests and, and what they're interested in. You know, we, we have, um, you know, we've done a lot of things. We, right now we have like a cauliflower, uh, cauliflower crust pizza that's absolutely phenomenal. And I mean, really just kind of staying on top of, uh, you know, as Clayton mentioned before, just that, that innovation on the menu, making sure that you have, um, you know, those items that, uh, that, that people are interested in. And, and, I, and I absolutely think it's, you know, it's important to, uh, to be able to provide those options, um, you know, so that you can, you can, you know, essentially satisfy, you know, some of the demands that are out there. And Clayton, for you, I know Honey Grow, you know, that's part of their, their brand. Uh, right. Not so much with five guys, so how, how are you guys balancing those different perspectives? Yeah, I mean, on, a, on an investment uh, basis, it's, it's far easier to grow into a market that has high growth and the, and the TAM is growing on, on, on the market. It's far easier for, for a, you know, a, a startup to grow into a growing market than it is to grow into a mature market where you're disrupting incumbents. Um, so it's, it's a compelling investment opportunity. Um, and, you know, as you say, Honey Grow is, is growing into that market as part of their uh, growth uh, thesis, um, so it's definitely uh, a real, <laughs> a real trend, and I think one that's uh, accelerating. Got it. Okay, we're we're coming on up to uh, nine o'clock, and I know we want we've got a few uh, additional questions in the, in the chat, and we want to um, you know break out in, in, into breakout rooms. Uh, Andy Watson, is is there any particular uh, question from the chat that you'd like to uh, present? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, Fred. I mean, you picked up a number of the, 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 the good discussions in the chat. I mean, one theme that's sort of come through, I guess, for the panel is um, obviously the sort of hospitality and, and, and restaurant field has had to sort of adapt and innovate as much as any industry through through the pandemic. You know, how does the, the panel see, you know, the industry, you know, in the longer term? And I guess, you know, are some of the, the innovations here to stay or, or is it going to be back to the way it was? Who wants to take that one up? Uh, I'll, First, I'll Andy, jump. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in. And Fred, I mentioned to you, I do just have to jump at nine. Yep. So I don't want anyone to think uh, I'm being rude. Um, you, you know, we, I, I take a little bit from, from what Clayton said and, and from what Neil said. I think that if you, if you were to ask me about what do I think of, of fine dining in 2021, I'm still bullish on it. I, I do think that with the vaccine, uh, the success of what a vaccine could look like, the better weather and the way that people have kind of innovated with better weather. And if you look at cities and, and sidewalks are being taken up, I do think that it, it'll be a bounce back year in 2021. I do think certain things will stay though. So I, I'm, I think the most interesting investment opportunity or innovation is kind of the ghost kitchen, rented kitchen. So if you look at hotels that aren't using their kitchens or you look at restaurants that are only using 50% of their, their kitchen, you know, can you set up a, a burger joint out of that and do delivery only, right? I think that type of stuff and the technology that's coming out of that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. There's a company uh, called Order Mark out of, uh, out of the West Coast where it's just a technology platform that connects brands so they could connect the brand like Iron Hill to a thousand kitchens in the United States. And, you know, it could connect them to already used kitchens that's partially used. So I think that type of stuff, because, you know, people of my generation and younger, they just want to order a burger. They don't really care where it's from. They do care about the brand, but you press a button and the burger is at your door in 10 minutes. If it's hot, if it's good, you're going to continue to order that. So I think you're going to see that type of stuff stay, but I am, I am bullish on the bounce back of the industry as a whole, uh, partially because I, you know, a lot of my, my world depends on that, but you know, I, I do think uh, I am hoping for the best. We'll let you go, Andy. Thanks so much for your participation and comments today. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Sure. Uh, 
continuing on this uh, kind of outlook for the, for the future, uh, Neil, what, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, so I think a lot of the technologies that, that, that we've kind of had to put in place really quickly um, through the pandemic, you know, involve a lot of touchless things, which, which you know, were, were around, just not maybe as, as adopted as widespread as they are now. So for example, you know, QR codes for menus, um, you know, pay at the table where, where it's all, you know, virtual payments, those types of things. Again, these things were around, but just not necessarily as widely as uh, adopted. But we've had to, um, uh, you know, to work really fast to get them in place. And I think a lot of those things are going to stay. I do think, and I mean, listen, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, several times, you know, we are about experience. And I think, you know, we're a place where people come for, for anniversaries, where people come for birthdays, where people come to celebrate, you know, certain events in their life. And I think that there's always going to be that need for connection. You know, as Andy said, you know, you hit the button, get the, the burger to the door. That's certainly, um, you know, here to stay. That's certainly going to be something that people are going to want to continue to do. But, but you know, th there is that sort of human connection that's going to be needed. So, I, you know, without a doubt, you know, we are optimistic that the future is, uh, you know, is, is going to be positive and we will see some return to normalcy. But I do think that a lot of these technologies will stay and they're good technologies. And I think, you know, for one, they just help with efficiency. So, so uh, you know, we're kind of looking forward to being able to, to continue to use these and to improve upon them and, and uh, you know, take them into the future. And Clayton, what, what's your uh, perspective? Yeah, I would, I, would, I would echo both Neil and Andy's comments that, you know, the technology uh, will continue to be a, a, a strong um, growth area and, and things like delivery will, are here to stay. Um, you know, I would say that that growth going forward will, will accelerate for those concepts that we're able to hang on through the pandemic. Um, you know, we've got inbound requests for retail space, just given the, the tumultuous environment in retail, uh, which is unusual and, and something Chipotle echoed on their most recent earnings calls where uh, landlords are calling you to say, uh, do you want to put our location here? And, and just the availability of locations is, is kind of unprecedented. And the unit economics uh, as a result of that have just gotten uh, even more compelling uh, for, uh, towards the end of the year. So I think um, growth will, will accelerate and um, hopefully continue to, you know, the, the economics will continue to, to look as they are right now. Great. Okay. Uh Mona, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you to our, our, our panelists. Uh, great conversation and also to our, uh, our attendees. Thank you for your, for your, for your questions. Uh, Mona or, or Zoe to uh, build some, uh, some breakout rooms. Is that what we'd like to do next or do we have a couple uh, residual questions, Andy? Yeah, so let's make sure that the questions are answered. Um, Andy, you have any other questions? Oh, look, I think uh, you picked up on a lot of them. I mean, um, there's, there's one question, last question here about, uh, um, yeah, what, what are the sort of primary risks on your radar? Uh, I mean, yeah, we're still sort of in the midst of the, of the pandemic, so we're not out of the woods yet. So I'd uh, just be interested to hear um, whether there's any specific risks that, that, that the panel's sort of focused on and, and uh, need, need to address. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, just as you said, I mean, we're, we're not quite out of it yet. And I think, you know, there's a lot of optimism, certainly with the vaccine rollout and some of those, um, you know, things that are happening out there. But, you know, we still have to be, you know, we're still being extremely cautious um, right now. And, and, you know, as I mentioned, we, I think once we get some outdoor dining back, but, you know, there's no guarantees on the weather. So it's the primary risk right now is, 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 is really kind of taking it day, day to day, making sure that we're still maintaining the capital, but also, you know, there has been a lot um, that happened during the pandemic of where, you know, you had, for example, um, you know, you could, you could defer payroll taxes and maybe some deferred rents and some of those kinds of things. Well, those are, you know, we're, we're now going to have to pay these back. And I think everyone was kind of, uh, you know, was, was all on board during the, the, the heat of the pandemic. But now that we're sort of seeing some daylight at the end of the tunnel here, you know, I, I think people are ready to get back to normal. So we just have to be extremely cautious on the on monitoring the cash flow and making sure that we're we're you know ensuring we have the liquidity to you know make it through this year and, and into the future. Clayton, any particular risks that uh, are yeah. on your radar? Yeah, I mean within our within our food space, um, you know, a foodborne illness, you know, contained to one one concept is always our our biggest uh, you know what keeps us up at night, and we try to mitigate that with uh, pretty exhaustive food safety standards and, and all of our concepts and, and you know supply chain checks and the like. 
Um, but that's that's something that uh, you know always is a, is a you know could ruin a, a concept that otherwise would be uh, a good concept. Um, but and then to echo Neil's comments, just continued <laughs> pandemic um, and and the the hurdles that you know uh, you know pushing out of a return to normalcy, uh, it's just, you know continuing to push out an end date is uh, is also a concern. Sure, that happened to uh, Chipotle and it set them back for, for a little while. Yeah, uh, I think they had a really good corporate response to it as best yep. as you can. Yeah, yep. not exactly. Andy, anything else you want to uh, share before we move to breakouts? Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.